Scott's mother had given him a machete, and he walked twenty paces in front of her, hacking and slashing at the edges of the trail. He was unselfconscious in a way that a boy can only be when alone with his mother, singing and talking to himself, pretending, forgetting that he was a teenager, numerically obligated to put away the childish things. Occasionally he called her over to check out a bug or a mushroom or the corpse of some decomposing Genusian fauna. This was an adventure for him. The treetops choked down the sun into the gut of the earth. Both of them were uneasy about it. They pretended that the sounds of the forest at night were worth little consideration, but they both felt primal fear of nature. Every rustle of leaves was a stalking predator. Every unnameable screech was the last utterance of an innocent creature murdered for food. They lay in the grass, wrapped in their sleeping bags, admiring the unpolluted night sky. The weather as fair as ever. Why bother with a tent? What protection was a tent from a mountain lion, or a swarm of nocturnal lightning wasps, anyway? Both of them had come equipped with a bolt-action anti-metal beam rifle, which they kept in arm's reach, just in case. Trick question, the boy was saying. It's the Big Dipper, but the Big Dipper is a part of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. The Mother Bear, Callie said. What about her son? His name was Arcus, Ursa Minor, over there, he pointed. The Little Dipper. Okay, smart guy. You know your star constellations, but do you know your stars? She pulled her sleeping bag up to her chin. Tell me this, for a cash prize and an exotic vacation to Red City, what's the closest star to our own? Another trick question, he said. It's Alpha Centauri, but it's not one star, it's a binary. And our winner, ladies and gentlemen, with $200,000 and a trip to Red City. His father would be proud. Scott Turner! The crowd goes wild, he applauded to himself and made a poor attempt at audience noises. Rating saw! The network orders a second season! The boy genius gets his third PhD. I'd like to thank the Mosquitoes for keeping me humble. They went on for that. A long time, pretending. They had granola and dried fruit for breakfast, strapped on their packs and were back on the trail before five in the morning. Why so early, Scott groaned, dragging his feet behind his mother, who had woken with fire in her belly. She stopped, turned around, and threw a strained smile at her son. Confession time, she said, dropping her pack at her feet. Pull up a lot. Scott went down into a cross-legged position as if his knees had vaporized, searching his pack for a snack before his butt hit the dirt. Oh, yeah? She sat on a fallen Shamira maple. This camping isn't all fun. Scott lined up two plastic packets of dried cranberries so that he could tear the corners both open simultaneously. What do you mean? Gally kicked at the dirt. Scott... You've never left Green City before, so you don't... The boy dumped the cranberries into his mouth. Some of them spelunked down his chin and into his shirt. We're currently in the northmost territory of the surgeons of the evil east, just south of Iago. The boy stopped chewing. 
The evil east? Bolter is less than five miles from here. Whoa. Like so many other boys, he had spent hours with his friends, speculating, repeating the latest rumor, putting on a brave face when asked if he would dare venture to the evil east, given the opportunity. Wait, did you bring me along for work? I've been promising, right? A vibraptor sang, barked somewhere in the woods. She had been promising for years, but always found an excuse to pull it off. She wished she still could. From a clearing at the top of a particularly steep and rocky hill, they could see the vastness of the refugee camp. An undulating sea of canvas tents in the valley below. They stopped to catch their breath and take in the sight. Callie said, These people. The boy looked at his mother, excited and nervous. You still haven't said. What are we delivering, Mom? A vaccine? A cure for something? Blood substitute? A cloud traipsed between the sun and the earth, and its ominous shadow followed suit across the landscape. She ignored her son's question. Used to be, if you wanted to live in Green City, you'd come to any number of camps along the coast to apply for asylum or citizenship. Now we've got just one official camp, which I'm sure makes things easier for an administrative point of view, but... These folks, interrupted Scott, nodding towards the refugee camp, they've been forgotten. Ignored, Callie gave a solemn nod. Because they're sandwiched between the evil East and Iago, a green city gangster, a terrorist Scott, named Tony Poseidon is exploiting the refugees here. You remember that awful gang that used to terrorize our own neighborhood, yeah? Poseidon's their leader. The Tonys. Scott knew the gang well. Always in threes, triads. I heard Skyrat ran them all off. She scratched her nose. Poseidon's moving in on the bliss trade. Minnie's actively recruiting new Tonys, and he's having a hard time finding volunteers. Who'd want to link their brain to a bunch of criminals? Not much different than joining the military, is it? Listen, I'm not saying I'd be really proud if you came home and announced the Tonys as your career choice, but it makes sound financial sense and keep you at home in Green City too instead of being shipped off overseas, into stellar space, or to another dimension to pillage in the name of the federal government. You get to do it at home in the name of a homegrown businessman. Tony pays better than the Army and the E.T. Corps combined. Better benefits, too. Join the hive mind for a couple of years, get out with a small fortune, a civilian job, one of Tony's legit businesses, in a place in the city. Unlike the military, where you would make a conscious choice to pull the trigger every time, the Tonys offer you a blissfully ignorant solution. Maybe you can even convince yourself that you're not really responsible for your crimes since you are acting on behalf of the Hive with literally no will of your own. Yeah, right, Scott guffawed. You'd be surprised what stories someone desperate enough would tell themselves, what they'd sacrifice, who they'd partner with, she sighed. Anyway... There are enough desperate people left in Green City, or here for that matter, to get Poseidon the numbers he needs to be competitive, so he's blockading the camp again. Nobody in, nobody out. No food, no medicine, nothing. Until it gives up another thirty-seven young men. Thirty-seven sounds arbitrary. Down from a hundred, area vehicles are being shot down when they get too close and the mouth of the valley is the only way to get in supplies by land. I flew in with a skid of nitro gloves and antimicrobial a year ago. In between blockades. It was ugly even then. I... She stood up and shouldered her rifle. We're here to set them free. Scott jumped to his feet. He couldn't believe this was happening. How? You're a courier? A courier who goes the extra mile for her clients. Come on. They began hiking, pace quickened by anticipation. We're delivering the means to mitigate the Tonys without a fight, but we'll have to leave that to the campers. The extra mile does run out. 
They hiked into the woods, quiet as possible, and stopped at the edge of the trees, fifty yards or so across the field of tall grass from the encampment's edge. Move quickly. Stay low. We've gotten a few scouts in and out of the way, and we'll be safe enough once we get out in the open. The patrols around the perimeter back here are few and far between. Her son was excited, so he could barely contain himself. She started to move forward and then paused. Scott, maybe it was irresponsible for me to bring you here, but as a parent, I feel I owe it to show you. Some things aren't understood until they're experienced, like your first kiss, or the first time you kill your own food, understand? Telling you about some stuff isn't enough. I mean, you have to see this kind of suffering with your own eyes. You have to see it so that you'll want to do something about it. She began fooling with the clasp on her pack, opening it and closing it. Most parents would be horrified, horrified to bring their child into this situation. Who am I kidding? I am horrified. I mean, this is essentially a war zone, but isn't Green City a war zone too? There's been a turf war in our own neighborhood. We've had kids kill each other over a street corner, a stone's throw from our front door of our apartment building. She had put the lid on his enthusiasm. Oh, I... Don't think about it. Come on. They crouched and made a beeline through the tall grass, hearts racing, stopping behind a tent. Tell me the plan again? Don't make eye contact. Don't talk to anybody. Don't stop for anything until we get to your contact, Dr. Juno. Exactly. Tuck your shirt in. Okay, Mom. He sensed regret in her. I'm glad you brought me, he said. She smiled another weak smile at him, believing deep in her heart that he had been a better man for this experience. I'm not, she said. His mother had not prepared him for the smell. It attacked without mercy as they made their way through the crowded encampment, first the sinuses, then the stomach, and lungs. Scott could hardly breathe. People appeared at the entrances and in the spaces between the worn and soiled canvas shelters. Quiet, but their painful shuffling. So quiet you could hear them blink. Their eyes were sunken into their skulls, their ribs, their distended bellies, the flies, the tattered rags they wore, their children, that smell. The boy and his mother were interlopers in purgatory. He was ashamed of being healthy in their unhealthy presence. He was ashamed of the weapons they carried. Tools, the memory of his father's voice repeated in his skull. He was ashamed of his own disgust for them. It took an awkward eternity to march through the crowd to the massive canvas hospital tent. Inside were a dozen cot boxes and shelves, which had once been stocked with medical supplies, were barren. Nurses attended emaciated bodies, adjoining the thin plastic lines running in and out of them, wiping brows and whispering soothing promises they knew they couldn't keep. At a table in a corner, three young girls were cutting strips of canvas, old clothes, and blankets to make bandages. Two of the cots held bodies with sheets pulled over their heads. A lifeless hand draped out from under one of the sheets, the pale digits grazing the dirt floor beneath it. In his mind's eye, Scott saw Ezra's hand, Ezra's blood crusted at the edges of those fingernails. A single fly was landing, orbiting, and landing again. He thought of Ezra's mom at the funeral, leaving her son's casket and then rushing back to it, sobbing, refusing to let him go. You people can't be here. A bearded doctor was approaching them. Following the doctor were three well-fed young men with greased back hair and goatees, each wearing a dirty, short-sleeved, blue-collar workman's uniform. A gold chain adorned each of their necks. Their sunglasses were mirrored on the left breast of each of the patch that said Tony. A stylized trident was tattooed on each of their right forearms. The doctor stopped when he recognized Scott's mother. He adjusted the white coat on his wire frame. She said, Hello, Juno. Callie? The doctor was pale. What are you doing here? You're expecting me. I'm the courier. This is my son, Scott. She motioned to the boy and said to him, Scott, this is Juno. 
He's the friend of your father's I was telling you about. He shook Scott's hand with a nervous fury, looked to the Tony triad behind him, back to Scott. This is a curious arrival time, as I'm sure you can see. What did? started the first Tony. The second continued. You bring... For him, the third finished. The sentence came out fluidly, one brain speaking through three mouths. Plasmid pistols were holstered at each of their sides. Scott was afraid for his mom, but she did not look the least bit shaken. Actually, she looked amused, mischievous even. Papers, she answered, removing her backpack. Their sidearms were unholstered. The second toady in the triad was left-handed, a rare individualistic phenomenon Scott hadn't seen in a triad before. Slowly, said the first. He was the Alpha Tony. The Alpha always spoke first. The second said, Slowly, slowly, the third one said. Scott tensed. He looked around, sized the place up, noting the civilians. He would fight the triad if he had to. This place is restricted. You should not be here without authorization from Tony Poseidon. She moved slowly, kneeling on the floor, reaching into her backpack. We're authorized. It's in the papers, fellas. Pistols were primed, and they hummed in D minor. Scott stepped in between his mother and the triad, palms up, saying, You don't want to do this. He forgot about his own gun. He didn't need it. The pistols went toward him. Don't be stupid. Juno shifted his weight. The nurses had stopped tending to their patients. Watching the scene unfold instead, Callie removed a clipboard and pointed it at Juno. See? She asked the Tonys. Someone coughed. Juno coughed out. I, I, I need to sign for a medical supply chip. That's all. Simultaneously, each Tony raised an eyebrow. Shipment? What shipment? Vaccinations, Callie answered. She carefully set her rifle aside. There are nearly 1,300 people crammed into this camp. Do you know what one single solar pox infection would mean for your potential new recruits? These guys aren't great decision makers, Mom. Scott thought to himself. Juno took the clipboard from Callie, sweating. I need a pen. He had no idea what was happening. Callie removed a pen from a bag. We don't know anything about this. We need to run it, boy. The boss. Callie smiled at them, not bothering to mask her disdain. Boys, I don't think you have one brain between you, she said, clicking the pen, acting to the vice hidden within. The Tonys dropped their guns. Their hands shot to their heads and they fell to their knees, mouths wide with silent screams. Scott's mother leaned into the face of the Alpha. Welcome back to individuality, she told them. The three of them collapsed. The nurses went back to work on their patients. Outside of the tent, Callie unpacked more Tony disabling pens under a small table. Refugees gathered round, watching, whispering. Juno waited quietly on the other side of the table, dumbfounded, cleaning his glasses for something to do with his hand. Scott stood next to his mum. What was that? Juno asked. Callie smiled up at him. Hypersonic signal, Jana. It broke the triad's connection to the hive mind, Scott said. Callie finished unpacking and slung her pack over her shoulder. The pens only jammed them within twenty yards, but if you get enough volunteers to march on the blockade, you'll take them out all quietly, likely without much of a fight. Kelly, my people are sick and starving. They're too weak to fight for themselves. There's no one else here from the city to do this. To meet us on the other side, Juno asked. We've made arrangements for supplies to begin arriving at camp again tomorrow morning. She looked at her feet, kicking the dirt. You're on your own with the Tonys from here, though. I'm sorry. Juno looked disgusted. Politics, I'm sure. Politics, Kelly agreed. There's no police jurisdiction here, and the military won't risk breaking the Bird Treaty and inciting the left hand. Juno picked up one of the pens to look it over. And your people, Callie, hmm? Louisa? 
Kelly bit her lip. My people have done what they can. I am sure, he said, spitting. To the crowd of refugees that had gathered round, Juno called out. Here they are, then. He pointed to the tent where the down triad laid. It begins with these three. A guttural sound echoed through the ranks of the crowd, as if they too were of one hive mind. How many of us suffered because of these three alone? The crowd inched forward. Kelly took hold of her son's arm. It's up to us to free ourselves and make the Tonys pay for what they've done to us. The crowd was transitioning from their acquiescence to a grim fate awakening with rage. The mass of people ebbed and flowed, a living sea of sickness and anger. Mom, wait. Panic overtook Scott. Aghast, he said to Juno. All you have to do is get within range and click the pens. Done. Nobody has to hurt anybody. Juno ignored him. He growled his words at the mob. Now is our time. The quiet which had permeated the encampment when they had arrived had evolved into snarling. The refugees had become a beast with many heads, many hands for tearing apart the enemy. Come on, Kelly said, tugging Scott away. We've done our part. Callie led Scott back to the hill and up into the forest again. After some miles were behind them, Callie said, Your father and I were seventeen when we applied to live in Green City. We met in camp, not unlike this one. You know, only with four times as many people. Scott had the machete out again, but he was unenthusiastic about the chore of clearing the trail. He said nothing to his mother, internalizing. She went on, There was a lottery. The winners were granted conditional citizenship. We won. A lot of other folks didn't. The echo of gunshots from the distance stopped them in their tracks. Mom? Callie put out her hand on her son's back and pushed him forward. Those of us lucky enough to get on the boat to Green City, we had to push past folks who weren't so lucky. I couldn't. It was impossible to look them in the eye. They hated us for going. I hated myself for going. The boy carelessly swung the machete at a vine, doing little damage to it. Where did the rest of them go? Iago? Some of them, those who were discouraged with waiting crazy enough. After your dad and I were on the boat, a riot broke out on the shore. People were swarming the ramp before we had even taken on all of our passengers. Things got ugly, violent. I saw it all, Scott, from the deck. They were shooting them using hoses, electricity. She stopped. It was barbaric. We had friends in that crowd, family. I'd never see any of those people again. Scott stopped walking and turned to his mother. Civilization is a mask we wear, she said. No matter what we tell ourselves, we're just animals, like any dog or snake. Scott didn't like that. The difference is, is that we can choose to be better. Galley and Scott met a small black helicopter with the police insignia at an extraction point, 17 miles from the refugee camp. Scott didn't have to be told that it wasn't really the police. The pilot had sandwiches and bottled water for them. He explained that he had secured clearance to fly them over the wall and land them in a commercial district where the company Callie worked for was headquartered. By secured, Scott knew that he meant bribed. That's how things in Green City worked, even for the honest folks. Especially for the honest folks. Everyone else used fire and violence. A mile west of the coastline was the circled island of Green City, a 600 square mile New Atlantis rising from the city like a spaceship peeking its nose through a portal from another dimension. Callie and Scott's home the home to nearly 25 million other folks, glistened inside its four-story walls. A safe haven and a prison alike. Scott had never seen it from the air before. To see the enormity of it like this was to be shut between the eyes with its perfect, unnatural, technological marvel. Boats and drones were moving toward and away from it in mass like bugs skating on the surface of water. Jets, Helicopters and spaceships, the winged creatures of this ecosystem, dipped in and out of the skyline, racing off and slowing in. 
near the center of the southeast side of the island were the towering skyscrapers of the commercial districts downtown. The tallest building was Minister Prime's, the empirical building, with its needle-like protrusion injecting commerce into the blue dome of Earth's lower atmosphere. Scott and Callie wore headsets to talk with each other, but he was barely listening to her. He was enthralled by the view. She was saying, Ezra was a fun kid. I know you loved him. This was a line of conversation he would rather avoid. Uh-huh. She took a sip of water. It was hard to watch you go through losing him. He wondered how they got a whole city to stay above water like that. He took a bite of a sandwich, turkey and cheese on wheat. Was the city just floating on the surface of the ocean? Don't ignore me, Scott. He didn't look at her. I'm not. Did it extend all the way down to the sea floor? You're upset about what happened at the camp. It's no big deal, Mom. He had always been curious about the architecture of the city as a whole, but now that he was seeing it like this, he felt as if he had to know how it was built. Espy probably knew. He'd have to ask her. Callie grabbed his shoulder, forcing him to look at her. No big deal, you say. Scott Turner, that starving mob was going to kill those Tonys. They were going to tear that triad to pieces and then go do the same thing to the Tonys at the blockade. You know that, right? He wore a mask of ambivalence. It didn't fit. That was unexpected, and I'm sorry, Scott. He looked away from her, but she grabbed him again. I'm sorry that I led you into that mess. He broke. His eyes burned from fighting back the tears. A salty drop escaped as he managed to squeak out. Why did people have to hurt each other like that? Because we're animals, she sighed, hugging him hard. We get hurt, and then we hurt back in retaliation. It's a vicious circle. It's shocking, I know. She sat back in her seat. Listen. I wanted you to be shocked, Scott. I wanted to shock you. I wanted you to see for yourself what's happening out there. What's still happening out there, even twenty years since your father and I came to the city. They were approaching the wall now. Some of the dock gates were open. Trucks drove through them and out onto the piers to load and unload cargo from the smaller vessels while cranes worked the larger ones. I know as well as your friend, Scott, but he wasn't exactly a good influence. Grades dropping, sneaking out, stealing, putting a brick through a cop car window. You never did anything like that before, Ezra. The cop was crooked, Mom. She waved him off. Living where we live, going to school where you go to school, it's a sacred opportunity. We made so many sacrifices for you, Scott. I saw that crowd moving in for blood back there, and all I could think of were the sacrifices we made for you. How grateful I was that you were born in the city instead of the mainland, Scott said. Ezra was like those Tonys, Mom. He was desperate. She petted her boy's hair. I know. I wanted to help him. The tears were coming now. I tried to help him. She leaned into him. Do you want to talk about it? The night it happened. He sat up and wiped his tears. Looked in her eyes. No. The helicopter began its descent to Evolution Inc.'s building rooftop. Tell me or don't, but tell someone. Callie straightened. Wiped her own eyes, preparing to meet with her bosses. Tell your dad. Or Espy. Or someone. Stop keeping it in, Scott Turner. You may think you're tough, but you're no superhero, you know. He chuckled at his mother and looked out the window. He was a superhero. Scott Turner was the Skylat.